Good morning, friends, and welcome to worship at Blythe Road Baptist Church. Welcome to worship online for Easter Sunday. It's Easter. It's, it's Sunday, the 17th of April, and um, it's a blessing to be able to worship in this way. And we pray that you'll be blessed as we celebrate this morning our risen Lord. We're looking at, uh, at the ending of Mark this morning, and we are going to find out how, as followers of Christ, we all take part and live in a never-ending story, in a story that never ends, and that's a wonderful thing. So come magnify the Lord with me. Let us lift up his name together. Let's worship. As we prepare to worship together, friends, let's come before God in prayer. Let's pray. We give you thanks, great God, for the hope we have in Jesus, who died but is risen and rules over all. We praise you for his presence with us. Because he lives, we share in eternal life, life of the ages, participation in the life of Father, Son, and Spirit, knowing that nothing past, present, or yet to come can separate us from your great love made known to us in Jesus Christ, our Lord, in whose name we pray and give thanks. Amen. Amen. The call to worship, friends, is a very familiar one. He is risen. He is. He is risen indeed. He is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen indeed. As we continue to worship together, friends, we're going to praise God. Christ the Lord is risen today. Amen and alleluia. Let's sing. Praise the Lord. reading this morning is from the Gospel of Mark. I'll be reading Mark 16, 
verse 1 through verse 8. So let's hear the word of the Lord. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, there is the place they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. And this is the word of the Lord. We thank God for the reading of it and for the hearing of it this day. Amen. When is an ending not an ending? When is a major chord not simply a major chord? When it's a suspended fourth chord? And I hope you won't mind me, or I hope you won't mind, rather, indulging me in a little chord theory. You know that, uh, you know that music is huge for me. And, and notes in a scale are, are generally assigned numbers. So if we're in the key of G, for example, each, each note is assigned a number. G is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So a sus four chord is a G major chord, which contains the fourth, which is C, G, A, B, C, four. So it sounds like this. So you can hear kind of what's going on there. And the way our ears are trained, it cries out. We're kind of waiting for the resolution to the G major. G major. And you hear this, I mean, in a song like, like Pinball Wizard, probably most famously, you hear the, the sus like... And in a similar way, uh, a song usually resolves to the key that the, that the, that the song is in, or the chord, uh, the, the chord resolves to the key which the song is in. So if we're thinking again of G, and we think of a, a chord progression like, like this, I mean, this, this chord progression you'll hear anywhere from, from Journey to, uh, to, to Paparazzi by Lady Gaga, or, or uh, When I Come Around by Green Day, this is the progression. want it to resolve, right? You want it to resolve back to G. And it's, it's, it's often, it's, it's, it's funny rather, often when we're, when we're playing songs in church and anybody who has, who has played music with me knows that I, I like to not resolve a thing. So I would, I would kind of leave a, a thing at the end. It's going... I'll just leave it. And I love that kind of ending. I have to tell you, an ending that is suspended, that is unresolved. And people talk about the ending of Mark in our Bibles. And, and people talk about the problem of Mark's ending. And, 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 and we said at the beginning of Lent, when we started this journey through Mark, which will continue, as I said, in the coming weeks too. We're going to go back and, and look at more stories from Mark. But when we started, we said... That, 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 that the ending of Mark, or the most original ending, or the ending that most early manuscripts have, ends at, it ends at verse 8. And the other endings that we have in our, in our Bible, from verse 9 on, uh, they're generally thought, although not by all, some people think that, that these endings were, were, were missing, or they somehow got separated from the ending, but, but most generally, people think that these were additions, that these were added on. And... It's interesting, when you read to the end, and, and you can go ahead and do this on your own, but we, we get, for instance, the, the, the line about handling snakes, which of course has given rise to just some snake handling, as you may know. But people talk about ending it at verse 8 as a problem. 
and ask the question, how could Mark have ended this good news story with these women who came to the tomb, leaving it being afraid and silent? And we're going to see that, that this is not a problem. There are many problems in the world, and you and I have problems. Well, I do anyway. But the shorter ending of Mark, the, 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 the ending of, of Mark at verse 8, is not one of our problems, dear friends. So as we look at this story and this good news that Mark has given us, is telling us about, let's come before God in prayer. Let's pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing to you, O Lord, our rock and our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. When is an ending not an ending? An ending is not an ending on the day that Christ is raised. It's not about closure, you see. It's never been about closure. If we wanted it to be about closure, then death would be the end. You can't get much more closed than death. You can't get much more closed than a body in a sealed tomb. At which point we might ask along with King Lear, is this the promised end? And wonder where in the world we're going to get closure. And here's good news for us this morning, friends. Here's good news. Someone has said this. The truth of the resurrection means that for the follower of Christ, nothing is ever the end. And I love that. The truth of the resurrection means that for the follower of Christ, nothing is ever the end. To follow Christ means that it's never been about, and it's never about closure. It's always rather about expectancy and living in a state of expectancy. And this is the good news that Mark leaves us with here in chapter 16, verses 1 to 8. And I want us to revisit where the story ended on Friday, where we ended off on Friday. And one could be forgiven for thinking that this was the end of the story, because after all, dead is dead. And, and, and here are the verses from Mark 15. I'm going to read 44 to 47. Then Pilate wondered if he were already dead. And summoning the centurion, he asked him whether he had been dead for some time. When he learned from the centurion that he was dead, he granted the body to Joseph. That's Joseph of Arimathea. Then Joseph bought a linen cloth and taking down the body, wrapped it in the linen cloth and laid it in a tomb that had been hewed out, hewn out of the rock. He then rolled a stone against the door of the tomb. And then this Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where the body was laid. And that's where we ended up. But this is a story of death that does not end with death. It's a story of failure. It's a story of human failure that need not end with human failure. These faithful women had never left Jesus. We hadn't heard very much about them. Until Friday, Mark had been focused all through his gospel. He's more focused on the 12 disciples. And in the end, their failure, their desertion of Jesus. But we found this out on Friday. And this, again, is from Mark 15. And I want you to hear these two verses. This is 40 and, and or verse 40, rather, and 41. There were also women looking on from a distance. This is when Jesus is on the cross. There were also women looking on from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, the younger, and of Joseph and Salome. And listen to this. These used to follow him and provided for him when he was in Galilee. And there were many other women who had come up with him to Jerusalem. And we thank God for faithful women. And of course, we read at the beginning of chapter 16, when the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. A new day. Dawns. Expect the day. And as followers of Christ, we live as people who expect 
a dawn. Weeping may linger for the night, but joy comes with the morning. Remember that song, that's Psalm 30, verse 5. Weeping may linger for the night, but joy comes with the morning. And these words echo down through the years. And as we read these verses, these words echo down through the years. The sun of righteousness will rise with healing in its wings. You shall go out leaping like calves from a stall. That's Micah 4 too. And what a wonderful image, particularly for spring. You shall go out leaping like calves from a stall. If you want to see something uh, edifying or good for your soul on, 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 on online, just, just go to YouTube and, and type in calves being let out in the spring. Calves being let out for the first time in the spring. And I know that you know that song, the sun of righteousness will rise with healing in its wings because we sing it pretty much every Christmas, risen with healing in his wings. And we say expect the sun, expect the sun to put in place his plans, expect the sun to put paid to our plans. The women thought they would need to anoint Jesus' body with spices. This was something that was done with, with corpses, it was done to, 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 to cover the smell of decomposition. It was done for the benefit of others who would, be, who would be using or visiting the tomb, which were for more than one person. And even now the women are serving. They had heard Jesus say, whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. They had been with him. They had heard him say this. And they are serving. As I said, we hadn't heard very much about them. From Mark, his focus was more on the 12, but the 12 aren't in the picture at this point. And Mark is telling us now about the women, and they're making plans. They're making plans which will never have to come to fruition. And we know a thing or two, don't we? Living through the last two years, we know about making plans that will never have to come to fruition. They're asking a question. They're worried about something. They're, they're, they're wondering about how something is going to happen. Who will roll away the stone for us? They're wondering from the entrance to the tomb. And they had no need to worry. They had no need to wonder how. And they hear and they see good news. And again, in, in, verse 16, in chapter 16, verse 4, we, we read this. When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. It's a story of death that does not end in death. It's a story of human failure that need not end in human failure. And we can assume here that this young man is an angel, a messenger from God. But when we read about a young man, we remember about another young man. We remember another young man from the story of Jesus' arrest. And this is from Mark 14, uh, 51. Uh, when uh, Jesus is being arrested, and we read this, Mark 14, 51 and 52. A certain young man, same word. A certain young man was following him wearing nothing but a linen cloth. They caught hold of him, but he left the linen cloth and ran off. Naked, And I'm not saying that Mark is saying that this is the same young man, who some people think might have been Mark himself, by the way. But that echoes of failure and desertion are ringing out here as this young man is being given the task to show and to tell that Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified, has been raised. And someone has described this young man's message of Jesus like this. We must read his message carefully. He does not say that Jesus of Nazareth is no more and he has been replaced by the Christ of faith. He does not say that the crucified one is no more and he's been replaced by the resurrected one. For Mark, Jesus of Nazareth has been raised. Jesus of Nazareth is going ahead to Galilee. Jesus of Nazareth is the risen one. There is no Christ of faith who is not Jesus of Nazareth, nor is there a risen one who is not the crucified one. The crucified one now raised has left the tomb and precedes the disciples into Galilee. In the person of this man who is God, who faithfully follows his call even to death, 
to make the way for all things to be reconciled to God, to make the way for all things to be brought back to God in the person of this man who shows that the way to reconciliation is through self-sacrificing, other-serving love. In the person of this man, this risen Jesus, who has defeated death and the powers that would separate us from God, in this Jesus, God has stepped radically and decisively into time and into history in such a way that human existence has always and forever been transformed. And this, my dear friends, is the good news. That death does not have the final say. And failure, and our failure, need not have the final say. He has been raised, the young man says. Look at the place where they've laid him. We've heard, we've seen now go and tell is the command. And this is verse 7, 16, verse 7. But go tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. And the women fail finally at this point. And this is what we read in verse 8. So they went out and fled from the tomb. For terror and amazement had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. But we're talking about a never-ending story here this morning, dear friends, and that's not the end of the story. That's not the end of the story. The women finally fail, and we read that terror and amazement seized them. I read recently that in the Irish language, one doesn't say, I am sad. One doesn't say, I am sad. One says, rather, uh, sadness is on me. This is interesting, isn't it? One doesn't say, I am sad. One says, sadness is on me. Or to maybe put it more poetically, something like, sadness has fallen on me. And, and this is quite significant because it means, when we say, sadness is on me, it means that we're not identified with the emotion. It means that the emotion is on us, at least for a while. It, it doesn't mean that the emotion characterizes us. And I think that's good. And when we consider the women here and this language of, of terror and, and, and amazement having seized these women, these women are not characterized or they're not to be identified by terror. But it has seized them. And they said nothing to anyone. And we identify with this too. Because all disciples fail. All disciples fail to speak. All disciples fail to act. And yet all disciples may be restored. And all disciples may be renewed. Even Peter tell his disciples. And Peter, the young man says, because Peter had failed Christ most egregiously and I fail Christ most egregiously and there is restoration and renewal even for Peter there's restoration and renewal even for me and dear brother or sister there is restoration and renewal even for you this is the good news of the story and so we come to this so-called problem of Mark's ending and the women are silent, and it's ironic, really, and, and Mark uses irony often. It's ironic because Jesus had spent a lot of time, remember, talking to people, telling people not to speak of him earlier. Say that you say, see that you say nothing to anyone, he says, after a leper is cleansed. He strictly ordered them that no one should know this after a dead girl is brought back to life as a prelude to a resurrection. We're going to talk about that in a couple of weeks. He said, see, he strictly ordered them to tell no one. But now is the time to speak. Tell, tell, go, tell. And people aren't speaking. But there's no problem here. There's no problem here because we know that the women did not remain silent. Uh, while it had fallen on them, terror was not their identity. They were not characterized by terror. And we don't need a longer ending to know that these women did not 
keep silent. We don't need to look at Matthew, Luke, and John to know that these women did not keep silent. Everything had happened, remember, just that Jesus had told them. Last week we looked at the story of the cult. It all happened just as Jesus had told them. The betrayal of Jesus happened just as he told them. The handing over had happened just as he told them. His death had happened just as he told them. And now the resurrection has happened just as, he, as he's told them. And you've heard me say before that I know the, the validity of Jesus' promises personally because I have known them in my life. Promises of presence, promises of peace, promises of transformation. And you know what else Jesus told his followers? He told them this. I said everything has happened just as he told them. And he told them this at one point. And this is Mark 14, 27. He said, you will all become deserters. He said, you'll all fail me. But he doesn't leave it at that or say, you bunch of jerks. He says this right after, and this is Mark 14, 28. And this is what he promises. He says, but after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Their failure is not the end. And our failure is not the end because we live with this promise of restoration and we live with this promise of renewal. And Jesus told his followers, he told his followers of a time that would come when they would be handed over to councils and they would be beaten and they would be brought to governors and kings because of him, of him. He told his followers that there would be a time when they were not to worry about what to say because what to say, uh, but to say rather whatever is given to them to say because it would be the Holy Spirit speaking. This is what he told his followers earlier in Mark. So we know that the women did not remain silent, thank God. And the, and the disciples did not remain silent. But still we end with the suspension, just like the cord. But I'm okay with that. I think resolution can be overrated. And the thing about suspension is it leaves us expecting something. And as followers of Christ, dear friends, we are called to live in a state of permanent expectancy. We talk about closure and we, we hear of closure and we talk of closure and, and, and perhaps it's the way we've learned the same way that our, our ears long for resolution when we hear a suspended chord. Perhaps it's the way our minds have been trained. We're used to resolution. We like it. They lived happily ever after. That kind of thing. Closure. But when we come to Mark 16 verse 8, we recognize that Mark has left us with a challenge. And he's left us with an invitation, and he's left us with a question. Only the reader or the hearer can bring closure to the story, and even then, it's not really closure because we can't control this risen Jesus with an ending any more than the tomb could contain him. And even the ending to this whole story, even the ending to God's story isn't really an ending, not when we consider that when the end comes, we hear a voice saying, look, I am making all things new. And he always goes before us and he always issues that call that we first heard by a lake. Follow me. The truth of the resurrection is that for the follower of Christ, nothing is ever the end. And it's never been about closure, but it's always about expectancy. The basic life stance of a Christian, the basic life stance of a follower of Christ is one of expectancy, expecting to see God in our every day, expecting to know God's promises of being made new, of peace, of joy, of God with us in our every day, in our day to day, expecting the day, expecting the sun, and accepting the invitation each day to go to Galilee and meet him there because he's waiting for us. And this invitation is for all disciples. It's for those who have failed and those who are unsure of the way back. It's for those who have faithfully follow, followed him on whom fear has fallen and has made us silent. 
Each of us have failed Jesus. I have failed Jesus. I am failing Jesus. I failed Jesus. This not need, need not be the end of our story. Let us not wallow in our failure. Let us not withdraw into our failure. Let us go back to Galilee. Let us go back to where we started. It's where we began, remember, we began our Lenten journey saying we're going back to Galilee. We said we're going back to Galilee and we finish in the same place with this invitation to go to Galilee. So dear friends, let us go back to Galilee for he is going before us and he will meet us there. And this is good news, friends, and it might even make us weep for joy, not weep for sadness, but weep for joy. Let us go back to the place where we first met him. Let us go back to the place where Jesus first called us and we dropped everything to follow us. Let us go back to the place where we saw him heal and where we saw him make whole and where we saw him bring new life. Let us go back to the place where Jesus healed us and freed us from our demons. He, he's going before us and he'll meet us there in the everydayness of our lives and we can all go along together. And don't you want to go? The story doesn't end here. And the question is always before us. Won't we go back to Galilee where he's waiting for us? Where, the place where we first answered Jesus' call, whether we answered it years ago first or whether we're answering it for the first time today and saying, yes, I will follow you. May the good news story of grace and life continue to be told by each and every one of us in our own lives. And may this be true for each and every one of us. For dear brothers and sisters, he is risen. Amen. And alleluia. Amen. As we respond to God's word to us today, friends, we're going to sing again. It's a, it's a hymn that, uh, that celebrates Jesus, his birth, his life, his death, and his resurrection. The most precious word of life. Jesus, our risen Lord. So let's sing together.
throughout uh, these weeks of Lent and continuing on today on Easter Sunday, uh, we've been hearing words of witness from members of our, our, our beloved Blythewood family about, about what God has been doing in their life and, and how God has been working in them and through them and what they have come to know of God in the last little while. So this morning we hear from our brother, uh, Dennis Bruce. So welcome, Dennis, and we're looking forward to hearing from you today. Hello, I'm Dennis Bruce. At eight o'clock on November 29, 2021, my wife took the long walk into eternity. Her faith was strong and her spirit unbowed by the cancer that had ravaged her body. She is now in the blazing light of God's presence. It's utterly unimaginable. I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither hath entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those that love him. Muriel and I were married 62 years. We lived and worked in four countries. We traveled the world and God gave us four children and 10 wonderful grandchildren. So we have a great deal to be thankful for. Muriel battled cancer for two and a half years, but she never complained. Never did she ever ask why, why me? She took it all in her stride. Her courage and her faith were an inspiration to all who knew her. She once said to me, you know, I have the best of both worlds. I said, what do you mean? She said, if the Lord grants me time, I have time, more time with my grandchildren. If he decides to take me earlier, then I go to be in his presence. So you see, I actually have the best of both worlds. Incredible faith. The day after her death, I was naturally overcome with grief and somewhat numb, but I sat down and I wrote a tribute to her. It's a kind of free verse poem, if you like. I want to read some of it to you. I won't read the whole lot because it's too long. But in the beginning of the poem, I say, you're not here. I get up in the morning and you're not here. The coffee's not on. The radio's not playing. You're not here. Your chair is empty. You're not here. In the second half of the poem, I ask the question, where are you? And the answer comes back insistently, you're there, you're there, you're there. Where is there? No more bounded by space and time, no more glass darkly, veil ripped aside, enveloped in light, surrounded by God's love. You're there, you're there. Received with joy unspeakable, you meet and hug those gone before. Memories shared reach back into time joys and sorrows, love and laughter, life eternal. You're there. Think of us still here. Our day will come. A gift from God, unmerited and free. The veil of tears be passed. The Jordan crossed. No longer here, but there with you. Our love restored. We'll be there. My love, this is not the end. This is the beginning. Glory to God. This, of course, is the message of Easter, isn't it? Jesus died and rose again. He conquered death. And because he lives, we shall live also. Now, in closing, I'd like to thank all of you who sent cards and letters, phone calls, soup even, 
and told us that you were praying for us as we went through these difficult months. Your support meant a great deal to us and, we, and I want to thank you for your love and your concern. Thank you again. Thank you. As we continue to respond to God's word, friends, we're going to come before God now with the prayers of God's people. And I invite you to pray along with me. When, uh, when I say we pray to you, to pray with me, hear us, Lord of glory. Hear us, Lord of glory. So let's, uh, let's come before God now in prayer. Let's pray. Merciful Christ, after your resurrection, you appeared to your disciples. You breathed on them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. You gave joy and exaltation to the whole creation. Through your victory, we pray to you. Hear us, Lord of glory. O oh Christ, after your resurrection, you sent out your disciples to teach all nations and to baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. You promised to be with them and us until the end of the age. Through your victory, we pray to you. Hear us, Lord of glory. O oh Christ, through your resurrection, you lifted us up and filled us with rejoicing. Through your salvation, you enrich us with your gifts, renew our lives, restore our hearts, fill our hearts with joy. Through your victory, we pray to you. Hear us, O Lord of glory. O Christ, you are glorified by angels in heaven and worshiped on earth. On the glorious feast of your resurrection, we pray to you. Hear us, Lord of glory. Save us, O Christ, our Lord, in your goodness. Extend your mercy to your people who await the resurrection and have mercy on us. Hear us, Lord of glory. O merciful God, you raised your beloved Son, and in your love you established him as head of the church and ruler of the universe. At the same time, he calls us sister and brother. In your goodness, we pray, hear us, Lord of glory. O oh God, you gave your only Son to suffer death on the cross for our redemption and for the renewal of all things. By his glorious resurrection, you delivered us from the power of death. Grant us so to die daily to sin, to die daily to ourselves that we may evermore live with him in the joy of his resurrection. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. As we prepare to be sent from this time of worship, friends, we're going to sing again our final hymn. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. So sing along with us as we, as we praise our risen Lord again.
As we go from this time of worship, friends, may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Go now in the peace of the risen Christ. Amen and amen. Down and then you say it, okay? One, two, three. He's risen indeed.